Uh, welcome everyone to the second ever Two Ball Blog podcast. I'm Sebastian Quinn, as always. Um, so it'll be a bit of a shorter podcast today. Just going to head into work soon, and it's been a very quiet week in the um, NBA. There is a bit of news on the Premier League that I'll talk about, but um, I think we'll just start a little bit about myself. Um, <clears throat> didn't get to introduce myself properly last week because of the um, free agency rundown. So I'm a 19-year-old uni student, uh, first year doing journalism. So, And like I said last week, this podcast should help out my portfolio for future employment. Um, in regards to sports, I'm a huge Houston Rockets fan. I've been following them since uh, Tracy McGrady and uh, Yao Ming were there. Actually, Yao Ming's the reason why I wanted to be more involved in basketball. He's the reason why I got into it. So um, definitely my inspiration to follow him. I'm of Chinese and Chinese and Irish descent, so there's that connection there to Yao. Um, yeah, it's just uh, the Rockets always seem to appeal to me. I think it was mostly Yao Ming's low post game as a big Chinese player. Then that naturally translated to how I played, uh, both in school and recreational games. Uh, with soccer, at least, I'm an Arsenal supporter. My auntie currently lives in North London. And uh, when I first visited, actually, back in 2007, uh, Thierry Henry lived across the road from her. So it seemed like a um, natural choice to go for them and support them. I, at that time, I actually had no idea that, you know, he was a legend and Arsenal had just won the, you know, the the Golden Premier League uh, trophy only a few years before in 2004. But, um, you yeah, know, I figured, all right, I'll support them. So ever since then, been following them week to week and... Hopefully someday get to see them live, whether that's in London or over here in Sydney. So, yeah, should be interesting. I think for most people, at least, um, started I started playing FIFA just after I started support, you know, following the soccer properly. Uh, and then, of course, the first team once you open it up, and if if you're playing um, in English, fr- uh, the game from England or Australia, uh, the first team that comes up is Arsenal because you know alphabetical order and whatnot. Uh, this is well before you could choose your favorite team and all that. So. Um, yeah, I think just Arsenal just seemed like the natural team. So as soon as they came up, pressed X, playing with Bergkamp and, you know, Terry on and all them and, you know, Freddie Jungberg, he was, you know, it's a great team to play with on the PlayStation at least and even better one in real life. So I think that was just a natural, natural choice for me to pick up, you know, so I think, you know, really not much to me, just, you know, 19 year old kid from Sydney. So just doing what I can. Anyway, I'll just jump straight into the NBA, some, Somewhat breaking news broke a few hours ago. Actually, uh, Tyson, uh, sorry, Ty Lawson being traded to the Houston Rockets. So, I'm uh, quite happy with that. Uh, so, the official news is from uh, Mark Stein, uh, Joey Dorsey, Costas Papanikolaou, Nick Johnson, Pablo Prigioni, and a first round pick traded to the Nuggets for Lawson and a second round pick for 2017. Uh, Lawson averaged 15 points and nine assists, a, nine and a half assists a game. Sorry. Uh, last season, and that was good for third best in the NBA as an overall um, uh, projection. So he's um, had uh, unfortunately two DUI offenses over the past year, and only one just recently, about I don't know, about a week ago. So he just entered a one month rehabilitation program. Uh, there's definitely a lot of on off court antics that um, have really gone not gone right for him. So he's uh, definitely looking for a change of scenery. In fact, when um, the Nuggets drafted Emmanuel Moutier, he tweeted, you know, you know, and I quote, I told you I'm heading to Sacramento. So he knows he's heading out of there sometime soon. And I think whether that, um, he's definitely leaving. I think he wanted to follow in the footsteps of George Carl, his former coach for the Nuggets two, three years ago when they won, when he won the uh, Coach of the Year award. And um, yeah, just really... Um, didn't fit in there. Had some really off-court drama, like I said. On the court, he's still playing well, and just can't uh, can't seem to fit in with um, the new players coming in. He's, you know, you've got um, Kenneth Freed coming through at power forward, and while it's always going to be a fast-paced style up in Denver with the high altitude and everything, I think uh, Lawson's just looking for a change of scenery. He's just just finished with. Uh, with the Nuggets organization altogether. So I think for the Rockets, it's a um, really good pick for them. They they gave up two, point, two backup point guards in Prigioni and Johnson. Uh, Pablo Prigioni, you know, had a had a good role, knew what he was doing, came off the bench and um, supplied some, you know, easy minutes for them. 
just you know shoot a three every now and then get some steals he he was um really good actually getting some steals off inbound passes once the rocket scored he'd always be hassling the the opposition's point guard uh nick johnson a first round pick of last year's draft he um really didn't do all that much for the rockets um you know hit a game winner against the timberwolves but other than that you know really just garbage time minutes came on good athletic player you know can uh, fill the box sheet, the box score if he's given the time. But I think at Houston, when you've got such a dominant ball hammer like James Harden, and even then you've got Patrick Beverly in front of you, and I'm sure in the uh, hierarchy, Prigioni came ahead of him as well, just in terms of the experience. So you are looking at um, there was a, a lot of people in front of Johnson. So hopefully he'll get some playing time uh, in Denver, which um, would be good. He, the fast pace would probably will more than likely suit him. Prigioni, not so much. He's, you know, getting old. He was the oldest rookie ever brought into the NBA. So that, um, you know, the, the fast-paced style isn't his sort of thing. But, you know, that veteran presence, regardless of how many years he's actually played in the NBA itself, you know, at 36 years old, he played overseas as well before being drafted by the Knicks. Um, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he is good for the young players in the squad. Uh, Joey Dorsey, just a backup center, really nothing special. He filled in while Dwight Howard was out for the year. Howard missed uh, 41 games, so Dorsey filled in at center there. And, um, you know, didn't score most games, get five or six rebounds. Really all his job was just to uh, protect the rim here and there, you know, uh, you know, finish off any inside passes, dunk it, put it away. Uh, he wasn't the best free throw shooter. I think it was something like 28% from the free throw line. Um Really, just a um, big body to get in the way of other players. Nothing, um, nothing special, like I said. Especially now, the Rockets really don't need him. With uh, Clint Capella uh, developing into the player that he is, you know, he's got some extraordinary length, and you know, threw down some absolutely monster dunks last season, especially in the playoffs when he did get some playing time. And while his free throw shooting isn't that much better, he started 0 for 15 for his NBA career. Um, he's definitely a young project out of Sweden. Um, sorry, Switzerland. Uh, that could be, you know, a center for the future once Howard moves on or, um, you know, if he does go down injured again, touch wood, that doesn't happen. But um, if he does go down again, then you do have a somewhat capable um, project coming through that can fill in, fill in at the center spot. Uh, Papa Nicolau as well, he was a, a serviceable wingman, just, you know, could shoot the three-pointer, handle the ball. Uh, he'll be a decent role player for the Nuggets, really, um, really nothing special. Like the other players that Houston traded away, just a lot of, um, a lot of garbage, well, not garbage players, you know, they're good players, but just, um, they really gave up nothing to get Ty Lawson, and I suppose the Nuggets were just desperate to get rid of him, so Papa Nicolau, you know, good ball handler, can shoot the three-pointer, uh, take it to the ring if he needs to, um, take it to the net, sorry, if he needs to, uh, put the ball away inside, and just, uh, once, once the Rockets traded for Corey Brewer, then his role was really made redundant. Brewer did everything a whole lot faster and a lot more efficiently uh, from the field. Papa Nick Lark would, uh he had a good percentage from three-point line, about 38%. But I think Brewer is just, his length and ability to run the floor a whole lot faster. Brewer just uh, is something else when it comes to fast break points. Just uh, was head and shoulders about Papa Nicola in that department. Uh, so yeah, for the Rockets, definitely getting rid of these excess players to bring in a point guard. It, um, Definitely one of the better pickups for them off, for this offseason. While they haven't really signed anyone, uh, they've re-signed um, Beverly and John. Uh, sorry, Brewer. You know they didn't bring anyone new in. So uh, bringing Lawson definitely brings in some offense for them at the point guard position. Beverly's well, Beverly's you know he's not the best offensive player. He's known for his de- defensive duties. Uh, Lawson to provide that scoring punch for them, and. Uh, Really give them something else, you know. When he's when Harden's on the bench, not putting the ball away, Lawson can come in and create his own shot, and he'll be able to um, provide some offense off the bench because the Rockets, while well, definitely deep in terms of player skill, their their bench scoring was never quite the best, or what it should be for a Western Conference, um, you know, two seed. So, you know, Lawson coming in, I'd assume off the bench. I don't think they'll replace Beverly quite yet because they've got a really good um. Him, uh, Beverly and Harden have a good partnership at the moment with Harden doing most of the ball handling allowing Beverly to do most of the defense allowing to take on the defensive duties on the other end excuse me um, so yeah they don't need to spend too much energy you know Harden can do most of the offensive work and then pick up uh, another player on the defensive side and then 
Beverly doesn't have, doesn't have to do too much on the offense because he's just a spot up shooter. Getting the ball, you're not not three point down, three point shot down, but uh, you know he's not about to create an offense, a pick and roll, maybe not even that. Just he knows that um, he knows his role as the defensive point guard. Just get hard on the ball, let him do his stuff, and, and then just to see how it goes from there. So uh, I think the Rockets definitely won this trade, but I think the Nuggets were so desperate just to get rid of Lawson that uh, they just had to take whatever was on offer and. I think a lot of teams weren't prepared to take on his off-court antics, you know, all the drink driving and whatnot. So uh, the Rockets should be a good fit for him. Uh, Kevin McHale, definitely a, um, a cool head in the locker room for him. So he'll try and um, calm him down somewhat, you know, to put it nicely, I suppose. Uh, for the Nuggets, I think, like I've been saying, they just wanted to get rid of him no matter what. You know, they, they're putting their future in uh, Yusuf Nurkic and Kenneth Fareed. So that should be interesting uh Interesting going forward for them, you know, like uh, Dorsey, just a half decent center. Like I mentioned earlier, these players like, like uh, not garbage or anything by that means, but just excess that um the Rockets didn't need. And don't be surprised if Prigioni gets waived or uh, Papi Nicolau and Dorsey get uh, traded further on. So that should be um interesting going forward for them. Definitely, uh, Emmanuel Mudiay should be starting for them. I doubt Nick Johnson will start ahead of him. But uh, Johnson should get some decent backup minutes. I mean, they've still got a uh, will through a Barton over there. But um, I think coming off shooting yard, if they both come off the bench, they'll be, they'll have a decent scoring punch for them. So uh, should be interesting. Uh, moving on, you've got Josh Smith signing with the Clippers for the veteran minimum, which is incredibly surprising. Uh, Jace move. So it was one point two two year deal um, with the Clippers and. Uh, I brushed on this on my article with him already, but he had, he had the second highest usage rate for the Rockets just behind James Harden. So uh, the Rockets' offense really did run be- behind him when uh, Harden wasn't on the court or you know wasn't handling the ball. So uh, last year he averaged 12.4 points, six rebounds, and three assists while with the Rockets. Uh, played 55 games with them, and um, after being waived from the Detroit Pistons, sorry, who are still paying him for this season coming up actually. Uh, you know, he's leaving behind his high school friend of Dwight Howard. You know, they're good mates. They uh, went to each other's weddings as their best men and whatnot. So another, um, that was very surprising for me for uh, Smith to leave them. And he he had, had a really good role with the Rockets. You know, started a few games throughout the playoffs, came off the bench most games during the regular season. And he really um, led the team. He was a good, great playmaker for them. And you know he could shoot the three. He was he below average three point shooter. Don't get me wrong. He's not he's not a knockdown shooter by any means, but he's definitely a threat. As you know, and in the Clippers series, he was knocking it down. You know, there was in that comeback in Game Five, just absolutely phenomenal from downtown. You know, there was a few shots where you know I put my head in my hands like, oh God, again he's shooting it, and just dropping it in. So I mean, when he's feeling confident, when he's got the team backing him, then there's a uh, no reason why then. Uh, he shouldn't be shooting it. I think the Rockets had a, a general rule for him. Shoot two. If you miss both, then no more threes. If you hit one out of two, then keep shooting. So I think the system for the Rockets definitely fits Smith uh, perfectly. But uh, he's moving to the Clippers, adding to their bench depth. They needed more players to come in and uh, help them out. You know, after they signed, they got Lance Stevenson from the Charlotte Hornets and then also uh, Paul Pierce from the Wizards and Wesley Johnson from the Lakers. They... um. Definitely need a lot more scoring coming off the bench. So I think uh, Doc Rivers quoted as saying that Smith will be the first man off the bench. So he can uh, definitely see, he'll be definitely seeing some good minutes uh, over the course of the season. But he'll be uh, having a lot of the ball handling duties as well, like he did with the Rockets. He was um, he, he was a good passer, and then out with the Clippers at least, sorry. The, um, there's no, no real point guards outside of Chris Paul and... Uh, Austin Rivers and Chris Paul obviously one of the best point guards in the league right now but Rivers his ball handling ability has been questionable his um outside shootings you know fairly decent but his playmaking ability hasn't been um quite up to scratch to uh, put it bluntly so uh Smith's playmaking ability you know he's like a good passer for his size at six six foot nine um you know he can score the ball take it inside there's a few good post moves well you know it's nothing special he's no Hakeem Elijah one um He's uh, definitely able to take it inside and bang with some of the bigger players in the league. So uh, it should be a um, a good season for Smith, I'm hoping. You know, you, you hate to see a player who who was a borderline all-star with the Atlanta Hawks sign with the Pistons and do you know, next to nothing for them, play really well for the Rockets, and then go to a Clippers team where 
uh, he should flourish, but, uh, you know, hopefully he just doesn't fall flat. So uh, his athleticism, he's 29, played 11 years in the league. So he does have that veteran presence, but uh, his athleticism is still there. You know, he can still throw down some big dunks and uh, just look for him to take advantage of the smaller power forwards. They can stretch the floor with him on the field. You know, like I said earlier, he's not the best three-point shooter, but still a threat from the outside. And uh, he can take it in and look out for a few dunks this season, him alongside of Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan. I think the Clippers will be, once again, one of the better teams to watch um, over the course of the season. So while they still no, they still don't want to be known as Lob City, uh, there'll be a few facials coming out this season, especially with the re-signing of DeAndre. Uh, so uh, last point with the NBA, just uh, Brandon Knight re-signing with the Suns. Uh, kind of um, no big shock uh, to be honest, he averaged 17 points and five assists across the season. Uh, missed a handful of games with the Suns due to a uh, wrist injury, so he got traded from the Milwaukee Bucks to the to the Suns as part of the Michael Carter Williams trade with the 76ers. And uh, this kid has a lot of upside. He's 23 years old. Uh, he's already scored. He already led the Bucks in uh, both points and assists last season. So. Uh, look for him just once he gets settled in with the Suns that uh, he'll continue that uh, the scoring. You know, he didn't blend all that well with Bledsoe just yet. I mean, that's what happens when you don't have a uh, pr- you know preseason training camp and all that. You know, he needs a bit of time to get used to the team and uh, settle in. But like I said, once he settles down, then they should be okay to um, play an offensive style. They um. Uh, they might be contending for the 8th seed, 7th seed in the playoffs. I mean, it's very hard to tell with the Suns because they signed Tyson Chandler to a 4-year, $60 million deal, which I've already voiced my opinion on how terrible that was um, in terms of just the finance side of it. Um, Knight, definitely worth a 5-year uh, max money deal. So I think the exact money was undisclosed, but I'm sure it's around the uh, 60 to $70 million mark. And they should have an interesting 10. I mean, uh, Chandler still can't post up and, you know, still has no offensive game whatsoever. So there's going to be a lot of outside shooting and a, um, a lot of driving kicks. So it'll be uh, interesting to see just how the Suns play. They've always been a run-and-gun team, you know, going back to the uh, Mike D'Antoni days with uh, Steve Nash, you know, 17 seconds or less with Amari Stoudemire. But... Um, there's really just it's really diff- just a different team and the inside presence just isn't as strong. You've got Alex Len there, you've got uh, Mark Keith Morris. Uh, Mark is being traded away to the 76ers, unfortunately. So I uh, don't expect much from the Morris Morris Twins this season. They don't play t- they don't play well unless they're playing together. Um, yeah, they're they're definitely an enigma of the Suns. So I think they might there's as good as a chance of them making the seventh seed as there is them bottoming bottoming out. The whole season doesn't work for them. They finished twelfth in the Western Conference, and then I uh, just it just doesn't work. They tried that three-headed um, attack last season, point guard attack with uh, Brent. Not sorry, not Brandon Knight with uh, Dragic, with Bledsoe and Isaiah Thomas, and that was a um, disaster to put it nicely. They just couldn't put it together, and you know it worked the season before with just Bledsoe and Dragic, but you know Dragic got fed up with the team. He doesn't trust the organization, and um, just really did not sit well with them so you know they traded traded Dragic to the to the Heat sorry who also just signed Amari Stoudemire so that should be an interesting fit over there um and of course Isaiah Thomas already heading over to the uh Boston Celtics um you know runner up six man of the year I think uh definitely deserved it but you know not much you can do there and yeah, so now stuck with Bledsoe, who who is a good defensive player for you know a six foot tall point guard. He you know can distribute the ball. His three point shots never been quite there, but he can knock him down. Um, and yeah, just great penetration. Can finish at the rim. Definitely one of the more athletic point guards as well for the M- NBA. So, um, that like I said, there's a, as good as a chance of the of the Suns doing well as it is them ending up a lottery pick. So, um. Yeah, that's really it in, all, in terms of the NBA for uh, the past week. Um, some smaller deals. Uh, Amari Stoudemire, like I said earlier, uh, signing with the Heat. Uh, Gerald Green also uh, signing with them. So adding some depth. They're on short-term deals, so definitely looking for more money. Look for especially uh, Stoudemire to try and prove himself again this season. You know, he was he was something definitely something special over in Phoenix, but once he left and went to New York, just... Yeah, you know, was playing really well until Melo came in. Don't get me started on that. 
And then, uh, you know, when he moved to the Mavs, just, you know, somewhat of a serviceable role player off the bench. Really, um, really didn't do too much for them. You know, rebound the ball, you know, six, seven points a game. Like, despite what the box score might say, he didn't do all that much for them. He's a shell of his former self. But uh, him alongside Hassan Whiteside should be interesting. They, um, the athletic tandem, you know, Whiteside doesn't have the best post game. He's definitely a high flyer. And, um, you know, Stoudemire with his developing developing into an old man, uh, playing kind of like Zebo and uh, some of the older players in the NBA. So, you know, it'll be a, a good season for the Heat. I think once Bosch returns from the uh, lung uh, blood clot in his lungs, they'll have a good season. You know, the two man game of him him and Dragic will be good. And um, I think I'm still frustrated with Dwayne Wade. His his 20 million contract is incredibly selfish. Uh, you know, wanting all that money for one season. He he still thinks he's one of the better players in the game. Uh, so much self-confidence. And I think this, the Heat offering him the 20 million is a lifetime achievement award kind of thing for the Heat. They're saying, thank you for winning three rings with us. You've done a lot for us, so thank you for that. But really, just 20 million for the one season is way, way, way too much for a shooting guard who's 34 now, really not doing that much. He hasn't played a full season in his NBA career, except for the lockout season. Uh, it's really just uh, overpaying for the sake of overpaying, in my in my opinion, at least. So, while he wouldn't have been the best fit for the Lakers, you know, I'm not saying that either, but I think the Heat shouldn't have given up so much money just to hold on to him. So, uh, you've still got him at shooting guard. Gerald Green coming off the bench will be good for them. Uh, you're getting Josh McRoberts coming back this season after a long layoff. Um... They've got some interesting players coming through. There's a a fair few power forwards and centers. You still got Has, um, Udonis Haslam coming through, who's you know he he's always going to be there for them. You know, hit that baseline jump shot and rebound the ball, and he's still um, a tough player, but he's not quite the same as he was before. He they're, they're aging. There's no way to look at. That's the only way to look at it. So to bring in some younger players, you know, like Green and Hassan Whiteside coming through, that is uh, really good. But they're going to have to look for a way to replace Dwayne Wade because there's really there was really no reason for them to hold on to him and to sign Stoudemire to a one year deal was just you know taking a pretty big not a huge risk it's low low risk low reward if Stoudemire turns in and puts in you know 12 to, 12 to 14 points and to go along with six rebounds then I'd call his season a success to be honest because this, the bar is that low for him right now that it's just you know if he puts up that sort of numbers then I think the Heat will be happy and sign him to a longer deal but um, I think going back to Dwayne Wade just briefly, I think um, this will be it for his for his NBA career unless someone else wants to take him on. Like, I think that once money, once more money comes through next season with the uh, TV deal, then maybe the Heat will offer him more money over a longer deal. But um, really, the one season twenty million dollar deal is just way too much for them to overpay for a player who doesn't who isn't even that productive anymore. You know, he's he was always going to be that off off court presence. You know, he's definitely got those leadership skills, but um, if that doesn't translate into a championship or at least a, a higher playoff seed, then really, then why why would you hold on to him? I mean, I'd say the same thing about the Rockets, and probably the good thing about Daryl Morey is that he's constantly retooling, rebuilding, and looking to win a title. You know, he pulled all the stops to try and sign uh, Chris Bosh last season, and then this year was looking to take on Kevin Love and constantly looking to improve the team, but. Uh, constantly trying to stay young. I remember last season, sorry, year before last, where they finished eighth in the Western Conference. The average age of all the players was 22 and a half. They were the second youngest team in the entire NBA and made the eighth seed. So, uh, Murray's just trying to stay young, you know, keep that athletic athleticism there and just, uh, yeah, constantly retooling, which is what the Heat should be doing. And they really just haven't picked up from it. So, I think we'll leave it there for the NBA segment. I'll, uh, have to do some editing and splice together these two segments. So NBA is done. I'm going to head to work and then I'll uh, do some Premier League tonight and get this up by Monday night. So I'll see you guys soon. And we are back. Uh, sorry for the delay. It's been a bit short on time with work and some other stuff going on. So we'll just jump into the Premier League segment. Uh, actually, might have been a good idea <laughs> me actually pushing this back a day because earlier today, um, Tuesday, Sydney time at least, uh, Vidal was um, signed to Bayern Munich um, almost to replace Bastian Schweinsteiger, who I'll talk about later, heading to United. 
Uh, so, by the look of it, Juventus is rebuilding their team. They sold Tevez back to Boca Juniors recently. Uh, Paul Pogba has been rumoured to be sold. Um, nothing confirmed just yet, but, I mean, I think every man and his dog's just about interested in signing um, the young Frenchman. Uh, Juventus as a team, they made the Champions League final last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. They made the Champions League final last year, and they've won the Serie A four years in a row, so there's really nothing much less, much left for them to accomplish. So... You can see why they're rebuilding, I suppose, with Pirlo moving on and heading over to New York City FC and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, with uh, their players, you know, getting older and whatnot. You know, Chiellini's moving there, Ogbonna heading to West Ham. I suppose um, it'd be a good time to rebuild after making the Champions League final and uh, they've got a bit of money, I would I would guess, with um, make, from making that final and also just the, uh, the age of the players, I'm sure, um, are a big factor when it comes into selling their uh, selling them. Uh, so yeah, he pretty good sale I would say. He was linked to Arsenal and uh, also United for a good while. I think Arsenal, who I'll speak about later as well, definitely need a defensive midfielder to fill in uh, with him. Vidal would have been a great signing, but uh, I think heading to Munich uh, will almost guarantee him uh, Champions League playoff at least. Uh, he'll be winning the title almost every season. There's really no competition over there, so. Uh, he'll get plenty of game time. I think he'll fit right into where Schweinsteiger was playing, and they uh, should be okay with uh, Juventus. Should be okay without him. Obviously, not the same team that they were before, but uh, they'll survive. I think uh, they're bringing in some young players, and uh, offloading him at this time will probably yield the most money. Uh, so, moving on to Raheem Stern, the young Englishman, he's a uh, finally moved to Manchester City for 49 million pounds, which is honestly quite absurd. So uh, it'll be it'll be uh, funny to watch him playing in the blue jersey and not seeing him in the Liverpool kit. Uh, he actually made his debut tonight for Manchester City against Roma in the International Champions Cup in uh, Melbourne, which I'll actually be watching him play on Friday. So there'll be plenty of, plenty of pictures going up on the blog for that. Uh, like I said, £49 million, pounds, you know, one pound short of Fernando Torres when he moved to Chelsea. So, giving you an idea of just how much pressure this guy's going to be under. He's uh, 20 years old and, you know, definitely a, a young kid. And Manchester City's buying into his future, but there's um, so much doubt over his uh, decision making, his finishing. Uh, he's he's still a good dribbler. He's, um, his play tonight was pretty good, although his first touch of the ball, he uh, tripped over it. So that was uh, pretty funny to watch, actually. Uh, he's, he actually His goal, he scored 140 seconds into the game. Well taken. Um, definitely you know, put the ball away, but you expect that when um, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one with a goalkeeper. Any less, and he would have been booed right off the park. So uh, I'm not too upset with this signing, but £49 million, pounds, he was always going to leave uh, Liverpool. I'll leave you that. Once a player, my theory on it at least, is once a player has... Um, you know, said no to a new contract and said that he wants to leave, that he's gone. There's there's really not much else a team can do, especially in the Premier League. In the NBA, it's a, a bit easier, but <clears throat> with uh, Manchester, with the football, sorry, it's a bit trickier. It's a lot harder to keep a player, especially when you can sign for almost anyone. Uh, and just, you know, as long as they pay the transfer fee and uh, the release clause, then they should be fine. So, uh, £49 million. Pounds. I see him as a Scott Sinclair, kind of Rubinho type player. Uh, you know, he'll come in and Rubinho, just to, for the comparison, Rubinho signed the day that the Qatari group uh, signed on with Manchester City. So they signed him and then he scored 14 goals in the first season, sorry, uh, played really well for them. And then in the second season, injured his wrist and then injured his ankle, uh, scored one goal against Scunthorpe in the FA Cup and then was uh, sold to Brazil. Uh, I can't remember the team. I think it was... Uh, FC Sao Paulo, I'm not, not exactly 100% sure. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's kind of what I see Sterling doing. He's, um, he's got poor decision-making, you know, a very selfish player while he was at Liverpool. His finishing's never been the best. And, um, you know, £49 million pounds is a lot of money when you look at, when you compare it, sorry, to the other uh, other Premier League players who just come in. Uh, Ozil, £42.5 million. Hazard, uh, £32 million. Costa, £32 million. Uh, Sanchez, most recently, 36 So, um, there's a lot of quality being brought in that aren't, my, that aren't that much older than him for a lot less. I mean, I think if you look at Sterling, he, he's not in the 
same stratosphere as the Ronaldo, Messi types. And uh, even in that second level, looking at like Conor Muller, Robin, Ribery, I would still put him well b- below a peg there, and I don't see him developing into one of those players. So, um, like I said, I see his, him as another uh, as another Scott Sinclair. He's, you know, good on the ball. You know, he's got a half decent shot in him. He doesn't distribute, but when he can, I'm sure when he crosses, uh, should be fine. But he's really just, uh, yeah, it, it's a really it's a high risk, high reward gamble for Manchester City, but. Yeah, I think as it is, they've got plenty of players, they've got plenty of money, which is what counts. And um, you know, looking forward to his season, but yeah, you're really you're putting a lot of money on the future of a young shoulder, so it'll be yeah, it'll be interesting to see him how he develops if he gets game time. I mean you look at players like um well, you look at half the players that went from Arsenal to Manchester City and they went from winning uh consistently finishing third and fourth and getting, you know, starting on the team to moving to a team who, who started, and they um, initially started and, you know, won the title over there, but then relegated to the bench once Zabaleta, David Silva, once, you know, more competent players were brought in. And, uh, you know, when was the last time you saw Bakary Sanya play a prop, you know, a consistent games, you know, a few games here and there. So it's been really patchy for them and expect the same thing for Sterling. Say Manchester City buy Royce or, you know, bring in a bombing or bring in someone of that uh that kind of uh, power and um, potential and skill. Uh, as soon as someone comes in, he just gets you know chopped right off and just pushed to the side. Thanks, Sterling. Forty nine billion, forty nine million pounds is nothing for them. So you know it's um it'll be a shame to see that kind of talent go to waste. You know I'm not saying he's a bad player by any means. I'm just saying that forty nine million pounds is a lot of money. So it's um it's as much the English media as it is the. Uh, you know, the uh, transfer market, I think, you know, Harry Kane's been listed at, you know, 50 million as well, and that's just straight up absurd, not just because I'm an Arsenal fan, but just watching him play, yes, he's a good striker, yes, he's young, you know, he's 22, 21 years old, uh, but 50 million is just um, extraordinary, I mean, with that kind of money, you could buy Sanchez and uh, Ozil and, uh, sorry, Sanchez and Costa, and pretty much, I think you'd be just about set in terms of your offense for that, so, um, yeah, there's really not much else to say. So we'll move right on to the red side of Manchester, who are doing things the right way and not spending that much money, but bringing in some quality players. So, like I said earlier, they uh, signed Bastian Schweinsteiger from Munich and uh, Schneiderlin from Southampton. So two great defensive uh, midfields. Midfielders, you know, Schweinsteiger, of course, a Champions League winner. A um, you know, he's won the Bundesliga countless times. He's always been. Uh, one of the core players for the German national team who won the uh, World Cup last year in Brazil. And, um, yeah, just a great presence. You know, he's great tracking back, tackling players, recovering the ball. I think he's, his best trait would be holding on to possession. You know, whenever whenever they're under uh, any pressure, uh, he's always got a, a cool head and he can uh, distribute and uh, play a pass through the team. And, you know, always making the right decision. He's got, uh, to use a basketball term, high IQ. Uh, when it comes to playing the game, Schneiderlin, on the other hand, um, not as uh, obviously not as prolific as Schwein as Schweinsteiger. Um, definitely more of a rough and tough kind of a uh, CDM. But I think you need that kind of balance in your midfield, especially for United when they're rebuilding their team. Uh, so overall, that the defensive midfield is looking excellent. I mean, if they play both of them during the Premier League and they rotate with Carrick and uh some of the other midfielders, then it should be okay. But um, if they play one Schweinsteiger during the Premier League, get Schneiderlin to fill in the other games, I think that'll be uh, just as good. But look out for both of them to have a very deadly uh, defensive tandem, at least. So, yeah, there's um, still a need for a striker, though. Uh, Falcao uh, signed with Chelsea on loan, still uh, still with Monaco, but I think they're just trying to make their money back while, while teams are still uh, taking the risk with them. So there's... um. Yeah, well, they're still uh, willing to take the risk on Falcao, sorry. Uh, Van Persie was sold to Fenerbahce for four million. He was a uh, showed a lot of distaste for uh, Louis Van Hull after his exit. I mean, he really didn't get an opportunity to play properly. He was always behind uh, Rooney as a striker, and even then, Falcao in front of him. I think Van Persie's always had a few uh, a long injury uh, history, but if you give him time, obviously, you know, he showed uh, glimpses of what he can do when he was on the field. So uh, a good pickup for the Turkish team who's building their side. They got Van Persie, now Nani, and uh, 
I mean, uh, they won't be contending for Champions League by any means. They'll be in the round of 16 or, you know, contending in the group stage, but don't expect them to be, you know, up there competing with Bayern Munich and whatnot. Uh, just going back to Falcao, sorry. Uh, I think with Chelsea, he's he has the opportunity to get his career back on track. I mean, with with United, he was, you know, to put it nicely, he, he flopped pretty badly. He, uh, I think three or four goals really just did not do what, uh, he was expected to do you know the clinical finishing was never there I think his first goal was a um, it was actually a shot from Di Maria which was hooked and ended up being a cross to him and it was a simple tap in and then another one he um, kicked the ball into the opposition player's legs it fell back to him and all he had to do was put it away and I mean when you're paying for um, when Monaco paid so much money for him you expect the striker to put the ball away when the ball's in front of him so uh, hopefully he can recapture his form with Chelsea. I know it's hard with uh, Jose Mourinho, kind of uh, reluctant to play a few players. You know, if you look at Mata and even Drogba to an extent, you know, played like 36 minutes uh, in his final game. So uh, good to say farewell, but I mean, <clears throat> a bit uh, disheartening for him. Uh, so uh, looking a uh, bit onto the striker side, I think United still are... Uh, they still need a, a defender and still need another striker. So looking at the defense first, you've got Rojo, uh, Smalling, Jones. Uh, they did they bring they did bring in Matteo um, Damian Damian. Uh, I can't remember how to pronounce his name now. Uh, who's a you know half decent right back, nothing particularly special, but at the same time you don't really need too much when you've got uh, Raphael and um, uh, Raphael in front of them. Sorry, he's a you know solid defender, and then mo- looking who else they could sign I think Ramos has always been on their on the radar for a long while now they uh, he was offered a 200k contract by Madrid which he actually turned down so I think that's one of the um, key signs to the fact that the player's not happy with the club and uh, doesn't want to be there and it may not even be the fact that Ramos is uh, not happy there I think he's just he's won pretty much the race to win at uh, Madrid you know Champions League won La Liga plenty of times same as Schweinsteiger really sometimes you just want to change your scenery and uh, just to get out of where you are, just, you know, a different challenge, something new, but of course, um, Real Madrid aren't about to let let go of a 28-year-old world-class defender very easily, uh, you know, they only come around so often, so they're asking for a lot of money, and of course, they want uh, De Gea in return, which um, I don't think United will be willing to give up when he's such a young goalkeeper and developing so well, so it'll, uh, it'll be a good signing for United, I think that, I think, uh, Ramos has just about left. I think United's the um, the pl- the team that he'll land up on. I, d- I doubt he'll start for Real Madrid uh, next season, although he is playing for them now at the Champions Cup. Um, yeah, he'll definitely fill in. Of course, Smalling or Jones will just get out the way. There's um, <coughs> really, uh, yeah, just, it, it's a no-brainer. There's no contention there. and It was like when uh, Yaya Sonogo challenged Danny Welbeck when he first started. He was saying, oh, <clears throat> when Welbeck was first signed, sorry, he was saying, well, you know, you're going to be fighting for that spot and you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing that. And Welbeck was like, yeah, uh, I don't think so. You know, Yaya Sonoga, who's now head to Ajax on loan and hopefully he can develop. I mean, he's a, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat or anything. He, he's not the best uh, French young striker. I mean, that being said, he's 20 years old. Um, striker uh, in the Arsenal system, at least, all you have to do is hold the ball up, turn and shoot. So, uh, you know, don't expect much from him, uh, but at the same time, he could develop into, you know, about a 10 goals a season player, just give him some time, but hopefully he doesn't fall through the cracks, so, uh, yeah, on the uh, offensive side for uh, United, at least, sorry, just before we touch on Arsenal, actually, uh, Rooney's their only striker at the moment, so you've got, um, oh, sorry, just going back to defense, they do have Valencia and Ashley Young there, so, you know, more players in front of them in terms of defense, but I think a, a good center-back will definitely help. Okay, moving to their offense, Rooney's by himself in terms of striker, and by the look of it, they're going to, play, going to be playing a 4-3-3 system. So with that lone striker there, uh, the three in the midfield would be Schneider and Schne- sorry, Schneider Lynn and Schweinsteiger, uh, Mato in front of them, and then the three up front uh, on the left to pay De Maria on the right and Rooney in the middle. But of course, you can't play... Um, Rooney every single game, you know, United's going to be in Champions League this year, they're going to be playing uh, FA Cup, Capital One Cup, you know, all that, plus, you know, of course the Premier League, so um, they're definitely going to need another striker, I don't think Van Hull is uh, too hesitant 
to spend money, he's uh, more than happy to you know pay play uh, sorry pay plenty of money uh, to sign some big players. It's just a matter of who for them. So I think uh, Edison Cavani was heavily linked with them. Uh, he would be a good pickup from PSG, but of course uh, PSG want Di Maria in return. So uh, I don't think that'll go through. I think one season with De- one bad one it wasn't even a bad season. One half decent season with Di Maria is isn't enough for. United to say, okay, that's enough from you. We don't need you anymore. Thank you for your time. Um, of course, Di Maria is a world-class player. Does did wonders for Argentina when he played for them in the World Cup. Um, yeah, he just yeah, give him another chance. Let him settle into the Premier League. It is a much more physical league in comparison to the uh, in comparison to La Liga. So you know, once they get settled in and they start playing, and once he gets used to it, then you know, expect better things from him. I mean, you look at. Uh, best case scenario, look at Sanchez, who settled right in because of his physical style of play and his bulldog mentality. But on the opposite side, you look at a player like Ozil, who initially came into the Premier League, you know, had some good assists, but was eventually just getting bullied around from the bigger defenders. So he, um, you know, he he went out with injury with his uh, left ankle, and then over that time, you know, bulked up. You could see he could he was physically much bigger and uh, much stronger just in terms of his body shape. So, um. Yeah, look for uh, De Maria to do something similar to that, or at least adjust his game. I think, um, you know, of course, he's a great player, fits the United system well with his pace and um, his skill as well. So Van Gaal definitely likes him. And the thing is, once you get rid of De Maria, who the hell do you bring in then? You sign Lavezzi there. If you get rid of him, there's there's no one of better quality to bring in unless they want to try and sign Walcott or try and steal Sterling. I mean, before if this was before he signed with City. Um but I think those are very unlikely. Walcott looks like he's going to stay at Arsenal. And of course, like I, like I mentioned earlier, Raheem Sterling signed with City. So uh, De, Mar- De Maria looks like he's going to be the incumbent uh, right wing for them this season. But I think strikers, um, they, def- they definitely need to bring someone in. They've got Wilson backing them, uh, Rooney up, who's... I mean, he's he's a half-decent young striker. Uh, I look at him the same way I look at y- Yaya Sonogo. He's... Um, you know, give him some playing time. He'll he'll put the ball away. He did score two two good goals against QPR la, last season towards the end. Um, but he's you know he's no capable striker to fill in during Champions League or maybe Capital One Cup. But it's a uh, it's definitely a bit hard for a young player to take on, especially that lone striker role which Rooney and Falcao thrived in. Well, Falcao not so much last year, but uh, when he was playing with um, Narco and Atletico, you know that lone striker role was ideal for them. But I would say a um, you know a big tall striker maybe Mario uh, Mandzukic, uh, even you know he would have been an option for them before signing. Um, you know maybe a, a Gignac from uh, France over in uh, Marseille or you know one a big striker in the mold of Olivier Giroud or a um, Van Nistelrooy. You know that kind of player who can uh, you know head the ball away, have his back to goal, turn and shoot, or with his back to goal uh, lay it off to Mato or to Rooney if they're playing two there. And I uh, have that versatility in terms of the passing. So uh, de- they definitely need another striker. And I would say definitely another centre back. That's uh, only if they can hold on to uh, De Gea. If, it, if, it, if it means giving up De Gea, then I would stick with what you've got. And so uh, my last point for here, just uh, my uh, favourite signing for the season so far, uh, Peter Cech to Arsenal for £11 million from uh, Chelsea. We was, there are a few needs for Arsenal this offseason. We definitely need a striker uh, to help out Giroud up front. Uh, a defensive mid, like I spoke earlier about Vidal, was probably our second most important uh, position to fill. And then another another goalkeeper, you know, uh, wasn't completely necessary. I mean, Ospina had a great World Cup with uh, Colombia and then had a really good Copa America with them as well. Pulled off some amazing saves. And uh, Chesney, who's... Uh, just about gone. He had some is a well documented uh, smoking issue around New Year's when Arsenal lost two 0 to Southampton. Had a uh, smoke in the shower. So I think as a role model and uh, player who's who should be um, very concerned with his uh, you know, his health, he really should not be smoking. And it just sends a bad a bad a uh, bad message. Sorry uh, to the coach. You know, it's just you know I don't care. Uh, you know, just some attitude problems and. Wenger came in when he first came in. He completely revolutionised the uh, the policy at Arsenal. You know, players were playing playing for longer, and uh, Tony, even Tony Adams, was saying that you know my career's lasted another four years because of Wenger's uh, what's his his fitness regime and uh, training program. So, you know, for a goalkeeper, regardless of uh, 
his cardiac respiratory health. You know, for a goalkeeper to sit down and have a smoke after such a terrible game is really just uh, despicable. So look for Chesney to be sold just about this offseason. Uh, Ospina, you know, had a really solid run with us uh, towards the end of the year. You know, had, had a few good clean sheets, um, some good saves. The one concern with him is his height. He's uh, six foot one, so same height as me. And when you're looking at some of the keepers around the Premier League, you know, roughly six foot four, six foot five, you know, those extra three, four inches could mean the difference of, you know, making a save and tipping it over the bar and Ospina just, you know, completely missing it. So, um, you know, while Czech wasn't nece- wasn't a complete necess- necessity, sorry, uh, he he was definitely a good pickup, especially for 11 million. He's um, still 32 years old, so definitely... A, He's, while he's no, you know, spring chicken or young player, he's um still got you know a good six seven years left in him. Goal, goalkeepers play until they're forty. You know, it was only this season when Brad Friedel was forty one that he decided to finally retire. So, um, you know, look for Czech to do something similar if he doesn't injure himself. Uh, you know, touch wood, he doesn't uh, hurt his head again. Uh, but yeah, I think the uh, the bigger question is what happens to our other two goalkeepers now. Ospina, I would say, stays, and I would say Chesney Shez- gets sold. Uh, Ospina had some good interest, some heavy interest, sorry, from Everton. Uh, they're looking to replace Tim Howard as Tim Howard will probably um, move to the uh, MLS. And uh, Chesney, I, I just can't see anyone that's uh, interested in buying a, pl- a keeper like that. I mean, uh, you know, he comes in and what, what if he's just going to have attitude problems again then it's honestly a waste of money so um you know if he stays at arsenal maybe we we let him go on a free transfer i think ospina definitely stays as a good backup goalkeeper so um our Wenger's policy with that is at least he'll be playing the fa cup and probably capital one maybe champions league i mean he's still a capable capable keeper obviously so um there's no point in letting that go to waste like we did with fabianski so i would say that check and ospina stay um Chesney gone, wherever it may be. I think he's out of the picture altogether. Um, the Czech, I mean, brings a lot of class and veteran leadership to the team. He's a three-time Golden Glove winner, won Premier League, won uh, Champions League. I think even for the younger, um, the younger players, not even goalkeepers, he just brings a, a good level head to the team. So, um, yeah, really just um, a great signing for him. So Arsenal's need still uh, looking at another strike. It was just just yesterday actually that. We bid thirty-one million for uh, Karim Benzema from Madrid. So <clears throat> um, the I would say that that offer will be rejected. I can't see him leaving anytime soon. And just um, I don't think you know when you've got so many world-class players around you. When you've got Ronaldo on your right and Bale on your left, then well you know why leave? All you have to do is put the ball in the back of the net, and that's really it. So um, there's really no need for. Um, Benzema to leave you know he's in a great position right now and I mean if you want to come to Arsenal then be prepared to win the FA Cup but that's really it so far so um yeah the uh, another striker is a definite definitely need I think if we put Welbeck striker it would be good but I think Wenger's quite content to play him on the wing uh, there's also this contract situation with uh Theo Walcott who uh he wants over 100k a week the type of money that Ozil and Sanchez are making but uh, Wenger's very hesitant to give him that kind of cash when he's been so injury prone. So uh, I don't blame him what's, uh, at all. I think uh, Wenger, obviously, he, he's not about to pay you money for what you could do when, you know, Walcott's had such a good future ahead of him, but keeps getting injured. So um, I would be skeptical as well. I think Welbeck would be a good striker just to change up the way he plays. He's definitely a lot a, uh, more athletic and a lot stronger than Giroud. Giroud's much better in the air, though. Uh I think uh, Welbeck's a, a bit more free with his shooting. You know, he, if he's outside the box and has the space, he'll take that shot. But uh, Giroud is more looking for the pass. So definitely different strikers, but, uh, you know, they are both are equally valuable for the team. Uh, another need is a defensive mid who uh, should who needs to help out uh, Coughlin because it's a, um, it's a bit of a tricky situation. At the moment, it's just Coughlin playing there. Uh, Cazola's been taking up a deeper position throughout the uh, year, but he is um he does like to push up in the attack and you know wants to get up there and uh you know play the ball through and play that last pass in and get the assist and score goals but um i think we need a schneiderlin would have been a great signing you know with that big rough and tough defensive mid who just you know out hustles other teams but uh 
yeah, I think now that he's gone, there's really um, and Vidal now as well. I think it's a bit tricky to try and sign someone. Uh, I think Wanyama would be would be ideal. I've always been saying either Wanyama or Schneiderlin, but um, yeah, it's looking a bit bleak at the moment. I've always I've always said we need another defensive midfielder to help out Coughlin. As soon as uh, as soon as Coughlin came out and you know he broke out of um his shell and started playing, you know, got out of his body almost. Um, as soon as that started, I said straight away, watch now, Wenger's not going to sign anyone because he's saying, well, you know, Coughlin's doing the job, but why do we need anyone else? You know, why does it matter? Why do we need another defensive mid when Coughlin's doing the same job for us? So, um, I completely disagree with that. I I think you need a, defend- a defensive mid to come and uh, compete with Coughlin and to also rotate. I've always, I said from the start, you know, watch, we won't buy anyone over the transfer window. Coughlin will go down in the third game in. And we'll be stuck playing uh, Arteta or, you know, ideally we'd be playing um, Wilshire or Ramsey a bit deeper. But I just um, can't see that happening. So I think if we bring in another defensive mid for us, it should uh, should definitely help out. But we'll have to see how it goes. Wilshire, um, funnily enough, you know, he's having talks with Wenger uh, just before the season. They just finished the Barclays Asia Trophy. So they, um, Wilshire, I think he plays a deeper role with uh, England. And I don't think he'll mind playing that role for Arsenal. I mean, he's got a good passing game. He dribbles the ball very well, uh, distributes the ball quite well, and um, you can't ask for much else. I mean, his his defense is um, there's still a few questions that are that are being asked of him. You know, we're not we're not completely sure about what he can do and what he can't do. I think um, there is that uh, you know that unknown. There, there's that unknown. It's not a certainty that he can you know defend the ball and. While he's definitely, you know, he's got that bulldog personality that Sanchez has, uh, it's uh, not quite the same in terms of, you know, can he make tackles? He's a small guy, um, you know, like five foot seven, five foot, uh, sorry, five foot eight or nine. Um, but yeah, when you're coming up against players like Yaya Toure, it's a bit hard to take them down. So uh, it'd be good if we keep him there. Him and Coughlin will make a good team. I think uh, Wilshire a bit more free flowing in terms of his offense, and then Coughlin definitely much, much more comfortable playing a defensive role for them. Um, yeah, I think just another striker would be ideal. Just there's a uh, Benzema would be an ideal signing, but if we could sign a uh, Lacazette, who's who been heavily linked with us actually, um, I don't, although the one the only trouble is that there's a uh, the matter of price tag. So I think uh, Leon have put a thirty million plus price tag on him. So you're looking at a lot of money. But uh, after paying off the Emirates Stadium this season and all of that, I think that Ars, uh, Arsene Wenger should be more than willing just to pay splurge a little bit of money on a quality striker. And interesting enough, uh, Lacazette, his only favorited tweet on uh, Twitter is an Arsenal article linking him to the team. So a bit of controversy, uh, you know, a bit of a you know sneakiness through the back uh, through the back door. But if uh, we could sign Lacazette before the season starts, then I think that'd be ideal for us. So. Earlier, you know, the sooner the better, get him in some preseason training. Um, there's not much else left to do. I think last year we were reluctant to announce Sanchez because we had the new Puma kit uh, coming in. So Sanchez was announced about two or three days after that the kit was released. So now that the new kit for this season has been unveiled, the away kit, it's just the third cup kit now that needs to be released. So uh, fingers crossed Lacazette is um, on his way or maybe... Um, another defensive midfielder, but who knows? It's just being optimistic as always with Arsenal. I think the only one thing a friend of mine always says is, I'll never trust Arsenal rumours unless the player's holding the jersey and shaking hands with Wenger. So I think those are words to live by. Uh, so I think that's just about the end of the uh, Premier League segment. Um, sorry for the delay in this podcast. Like I said earlier, it's been a few time constraints and whatnot, a few things popping up. Uh, just some housekeeping, you know, the best way to keep in touch with us is uh, through the website, which I'll link here in the YouTube uh, description. Uh, tweet me at uh, Sebastian underscore Quinn, that's Sebastian without the T. Or uh, leave a comment on, on any article that we leave there in the uh, website. So uh, check it out. Follow us on Facebook, 2 Blog. It's the uh, same as that, almost at 50 likes now. So we're getting there and we'll leave it there. See you next week.